Well, today we're going to continue our look at, uh, we started last week looking at some of the disturbing realities of the world that we live in and how we as Christians can respond to them. Now, last week we talked about mass shootings and acts of terror. Today we're going to take a look at natural disasters. And we'll also put in their illness as well, because anybody who's suffered from a life debilitating or a life ending illness knows that that can be devastating for the entire family. And that can feel the same as a natural disaster. Uh, 2017 has had its fill of, of bad things, uh, hurricanes, wildfires, mudslides as a result of that, uh, floods, drought, you name it. In fact, at one point in 2017, no sooner was one hurricane gone than another historic hur hurricane was on its way within a few days somewhere else. You know, just kind of had, had us really, you know, hard to catch up with all these things. And when these things happen, we tend to ask why. Because we want to make sense of it. You know, we want to make logical sense of the world and come up with reasons for why this would happen. Why, why is that happening there? Why is this happening there? And we try to come up with a reason for it. And that's because of a basic supposition about how we think the world should work. And that is that good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people. Right? I mean, that's justice. You know? That uh, if, if something bad happens, it must be punishment for something. And so we tend to think that way. We tend to view the world that way. Even if on one level we know that's not true, on another level we think it is. And if you don't think so, just wait until you're diagnosed with a life-altering diagnosis. And all of a sudden, you start thinking thoughts about, why me? Why is this happening to me? Why am I being, you know, what did I do to deserve this? I remember early on in my ministry, I visited someone in the hospital who had, uh, I was acting as a kind of a temporary chaplain in a hospital. And this person was in her older years, and she was gravely ill, and she was thinking that she was being punished by God, uh, probably for not being involved in church. Uh, and so she uh, was asking about that. Now keep in mind, she'd been healthy her whole life up until this point. But she was asking about that. And so we tend to do that. We tend to think that the world should operate in that way. Good things happen to good people. Bad things happen to bad people. And that can make us feel superior when it happens to other people. But then when it happens to us, we feel really guilty, like we've done something wrong, like we're being punished. And so what does the Bible, we're going to take a look at what the Bible has to say about this. And I'm aware that our service is going to go long uh, today, probably about 15 minutes later than usual. And if any of you need to leave for some reason, if you have something you need to get to, feel free to do so. I won't be offended in any way. <laughs> you know, I really won't. But... What does the Bible have to say about this? Because it's actually quite complicated. The Bible is not, it depends on where you read. Let's put it that way. It depends on where you read on this subject of why bad things happen. Uh, there are what I call voices, the, the predominant theology of the Bible, and then there are the counter voices that argue against that prevailing theology. And they're all in the Bible. They're all right there. The Bible argues with itself. And so, first of all, the prevailing theology is just that. Good things happen to good people. If something bad happens, it happens because somebody sinned. And so somebody, that made it necessary. And so you see this all over the Bible, especially the Old Testament. But you see, uh, for instance, if a woman is infertile, it is either because she or somebody in her family has sinned and done something wrong. Uh, if there is a famine or a drought or uh, anything of that nature, it's usually because somebody or a group of people have sinned. In fact, if you read the history of Israel in Chronicles and Kings, you will find that every time something negative happens, there's a logical reason for it. It has to be connected to something. And so if the king that particular time happens to be uh, not following God and is encouraging other people to turn away from God as well, then they say, well, that's the reason. It's because uh, we've turned away from God, and so God's punishing us. If the king happens to be good at that time, and they're following God, then they'll connect it to a king generations ago. So they'll say, well, this king is following God, but uh, God is still punishing us today because of that king who ruled uh, three generations ago. So God is punishing us, he, you know, never mind the fact that none of us were alive then when that happened, but, you know, it makes sense. 
And uh, so th there has to be a logical cause. There has to be a logical reason for everything bad that happens. If only the world was that simple. Because then we could control things. And then we could make sure the bad things don't happen if we just do the right things, right? That's how we tend to think sometimes. If I do good, if I try to be a good person, God's going to bless me and good things are going to happen. But then when bad things inevitably happen, then we start to doubt God and we start to doubt ourselves. Now, a word about the Bible itself. Uh, because I've said some interesting statements. Uh, Christians have all kinds of different opinions about how the Bible works. But I think that all Christians can agree that God and humanity were both involved in the creation of the Bible. Where we disagree is how exactly that works. To what extent is it God? To what extent are people involved? And so on one end of the spectrum, you have uh, more, more on the conservative side of the spectrum, you have people who believe that God has the primary role by far in the creation of scripture. And that the authors, the human authors, uh, pretty much wrote down word for word exactly what God wanted them to say. You know, it's kind of like if they're acting as a scribe. So, you know, Paul, when he wrote his letters in the New Testament, he had a, a man with him who actually wrote his letters for him. And he would tell them what to say word for word. And so some people view the Bible that way, that God, uh, people just acted as kind of a passive scribes that would just write down exactly word for word what God wanted to say. <coughs> and in that case, the Bible must be perfect in every way, shape and form. It must be correct. In every subject, whether we're talking about God or physics or meteorology, the beginnings of the universe, uh, anything, the Bible has to be 100% perfect, which makes sense. Because if it's written completely by God, pretty much, then it should be. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you have uh, Christians who believe that humanity has should get more credit than they get. And they, they would say that whereas God inspired the, the authors to write, and God's message shines through in the scripture. Nonetheless, we also see the personalities of the authors. We see some of their cultural assumptions and their scientific or pre-scientific understandings of the world show through in their writings. And so the message of God is filtered through fallible human beings. According to that viewpoint, there is room to question if the scientific community, uh, if you... If the scientific community says something may be a little bit different than the way that we might read scripture, then uh, that might uh, then lead us to go to that scripture and question whether or not we're reading it correctly. Uh, on the more conservative side, it would be, well, science is wrong because scripture has to be right. And so you have these different viewpoints talking about each other. And scholars know that for the biblical authors, their worldview was quite different than our own. Uh, for the biblical authors, the world was a flat disk resting on pillars, and the sky was a solid dome. Above the sky, God had his storehouses for hail, snow, rain, etc. And also above the sky was water. That's why the sky is blue. You know, there's water above the sky. And God could send down water from the, the heavens at any time and completely flood the earth. And so this is the general viewpoint, not just of the biblical authors, but of anybody living in that time period. Because when you think about it, if you don't have some of the instruments that we have today, if you don't have science, if you don't have those things, that makes perfect sense of the world. And everything is directly caused by God, the micromanager who does absolutely everything. So if it rains one day, God directly sent that rain for a reason. If it doesn't rain, God directly did not send that rain for a reason. Now, today, things are a little bit different. We view the world much differently than they did back then. But it doesn't mean that because they viewed the world differently that they weren't inspired by God. It doesn't mean that if they viewed the world differently that we cannot find the God, God speaking to us in the Scripture. It just means that they didn't have the same view of the world that we did. Now, we understand things a little bit differently than they did. But God's message, message still rings clear to us today. Uh, for instance, weather is not as mysterious as it once was. Uh, we kind of know. It's kind of interesting. We joke that meteorologists are the only ones who can be wrong so often and still keep their jobs. But uh, really, how many people's jobs is to predict the future? 
and really they're pretty accurate, all things considered. You know, they can pretty accurately tell generally what the weather's going to be a week or more in advance. And that's because they understand that weather is caused by a vast array of elements in the atmosphere. But it's actually quite predictable because they form weather patterns. And so it seems as though rather than being a micromanager, God is kind of sets things in motion and creates some laws to govern the world, but doesn't necessarily directly send weather for a particular reason. Not that he couldn't, but it doesn't seem as though the world operates that way. And so we look at life today, you know, we still have these assumptions. When, when the, uh, I think it was a hurricane hit New Orleans and there was this historic flooding there, there was a Christian leader on TV saying that this was God judging them for their sins. That's interesting though because the people who were hit the most by that flood in New Orleans were farmers in outlying areas and the poorest of the poor. The red light district was back in business pretty quickly and doing uh, better than ever. So if that was sent by God to judge the <coughs> sins, he didn't do a very good job. Right? So the world is more complicated than we sometimes make it out to be. There are good people and bad people everywhere. As I mentioned last week, even North Korea has good people in it. And so it's not as simple as, well, God sent that to punish them over there. And by the way, it's easy to say it when it's them over there rather than us right here. If we're him, it's not God's judgment, you know. No. And so we really have to think carefully about this. Earthquakes. How many earthquakes have they had in Haiti? Why then? You know, are they being punished by God? Does it make more sense to say that they're being punished by God? Or does it make more sense to say that through science we know that the Earth's crust is made of tectonic plates? that move and bump into each other. And sometimes when they bump into each other, they release heat and energy from Earth's core. And that earthquakes actually regulate Earth's internal temperature so that we can continue to have life on Earth. If it were not for earthquakes, we would not be able to have life on Earth. Which one makes more sense? <coughs> we talk about illness. That lady in the hospital. Was she being punished by God? I don't think so. Because the fact is, she was healthy most of her life. She, had, she said she didn't really ever have to go to the hospital in her life. Now she was in her older years and she was gravely ill. But the reality is we all die, right? We all have to die. And so something has to happen, right, at some point. I mean, it's just the, it's the way it is. And so I don't think she was being punished. I think she was blessed with a life where she didn't really have to worry about her health. Whereas there are many people who are active in church, serving in church, who go through their entire lives suffering from health problems. And so, as we see, the answers sometimes are a little bit more complicated. We tend to want to think that everything happens for a reason, that everything is God's will or fits somehow into God's plan. For some people, that can be comforting. For some people, that can be really disturbing to think that God is responsible for all the horrible things that happen in the world. You know, we use, we talked in confirmation about the Wesleyan quadrilateral. We use scripture, and then to help us interpret scripture, we use reason, which is your mind, experience, and tradition. Using my mind, reasoning, I know that no plan that involves the deaths of millions of people through war, natural disaster, illness, or any other catastrophe to accomplish some greater good is a good plan, no matter what it is. If any person in the world had some kind of plan to kill millions of people for a greater good, many of you know that that did happen and does happen. If anyone had that type of a plan, we would call that plan sadistic, and we would place that person in prison for life or have them executed. And yet, every day, we, we tend to say that God is responsible for the same types of things, and we call it good. Well, I don't know. It must be God's will. It must be a part of God's plan. I don't know. I kind of tend to think, and you can disagree with me, but I kind of tend to think that things happen all the time in our world that are not God's plan. Things happen all the time that are not God's will. Our freedom necessitates this. If we can make choices, then it goes to bear that we can choose things that are against God's will. And things happen in this world that are against God's will. Nonetheless, 
I think that God is so wise and flexible that God's plan is still going to be successful and God's plan is still going to be accomplished no matter what happens in the world because God is greater than the world. God can accomplish his will and even bring good out of the evil because he is that wise and that flexible. God can work out of the tragedies. God can work out of the horror. You know, we think about illness. What causes illness to come upon us? What causes illness to come on people? Why did my father get diagnosed with stage 4 esophageal cancer when he was 68? There were no risk factors for that. Did God send that to punish him? Or did God send that to develop some kind of character trait in him that he didn't have before? Or did God send that to develop character traits in those around him that they didn't have before? Those are some of the reasons that we give to try to justify things. Or is it that we know through science that there's a whole microscopic world of bacteria and viruses, some of which are beneficial to us, some of which are not? And could it be that in the world of cells, there was some random event, maybe it was an accident, who knows, that set off a chain reaction where cells started to divide rapidly and become cancerous. Which, which makes more sense? You see, I think that we really have to think about the implications sometimes of what we say and what we believe. You know, I think that things happen that are not God's will. I don't think God wants death. I don't think God wants uh, natural disaster. I don't think God wants these things. Now you could ask, well, why? Why then did God create a world that needs earthquakes to self-regulate? You know, why did God create a world that needs floods, that that has illness and all these things? I don't know. I do know that in the beginning the world was not that way, and in the end the world will not be that way. I know that much. So I know that it must not be what God would want. Until then, we have to rest secure in knowing that, that God is, is greater than anything that may happen in the world. And God is always with us. Yes, there are some things that happen in the world that don't seem to have a logical cause. There are some things that happen that are unfair. There are some things that happen that we cannot pinpoint to, well, this person sinned and that happened or, or whatever. We cannot always pinpoint it to that. Sometimes the best response for a Christian after a natural disaster is rather than saying anything or trying to figure out why, just help. You know, don't judge, just help. You can make a t-shirt that says that. Don't judge, just help. You know, if somebody's facing a, a disaster because of an illness or something, go do their laundry. Ask them first. Yeah, but go do their laundry. <laughs> <laughs> Bring them a meal. That you could probably do without asking. But, uh, you know, do something to help them. Pray for them. Send money. You know, natural disasters, sending money is the easiest way. But you can also go and help. You know, maybe an Iowa town is devastated by a tornado. Maybe we can go help somehow. You know, that's one of the great ways that God works good out of the bad things that happens. The scripture teaches us that God can work good out of all the bad things that happen for those that love him. Now, it doesn't say he causes all the bad things to happen, but God can work good out of it. And I believe that's true. <coughs> and so, as Christians, when these things happen, when disasters happen, whatever it is, don't judge. Just help. You know, we naturally ask why, but we know that a lot of those questions aren't going to be answered. But we do know what we can do. Okay, I don't know why this happened, but I know what I can do. I can send money. I can help. I can go bring a meal. I can go talk to the person, keep them company, you know, on and on and on and on. I can be the hands and feet of Christ. I can make a difference. And by so doing, you will fulfill the greatest commandment of loving God.